so welcome everybody to the next episode of the value prop uh, brought to you by the pacific basin economic council i'm delighted today to be joined by wolfgang fengler who's based in vienna in europe um, who's a lead economist and sector leader southern africa at the world bank but the reason for my connecting with him today is really to talk about developing economies versus the developed economies using data-driven uh, tools which one of which is now becoming very valuable that is under the mandate of the world bank called the world data lab which we're going to go into in a bit more detail with wolfgang before i do without further ado i'd like to say hello to wolfgang and let him introduce very briefly about himself so welcome wolfgang to the latest episode well it's so great to be with you michael uh, and it's wonderful the type of work you're doing and to connect the world and helping to explain global shifts um as you noted i've quite a background in developing and emerging economies, but those also where uh, the connections to Asia seem to be quite relevant. So I lived in Indonesia for five years and I worked also quite a bit on Central Asia in addition to my Africa focus. So, but yeah, my true passion is data and making data relevant for everybody and look forward to talking to you about it. So Wolfgang, we were talking earlier before we came on air, um, obviously on various topics and everything, but in particular, you know, part of what you've been gathering, if you can explain exactly what was the purpose behind developing a tool such as the World Data Lab, how relevant is it in today's business world, uh, especially given, you know, all the challenges now as we come out of a pandemic, uh, people are going to be looking more and more as to like, what are the new opportunities, how can they maybe recover their revenue and, and of course there's some sectors that have had exponential growth as a result of the pandemic, how do they stop take stock and reassess their whole strategy going forward and yeah. we've agreed that it's going to be very much based on data uh, so maybe you can explain a little bit about what you guys have been working on and uh, have created there in vienna which really has a global audience and relevance no thanks so much michael and um obviously the, the initiating point was um my partner homie karas who has been leading the sustainable development goals for the un and basically the SDGs came up with this concept of a data revolution, in the sense there is not, there's a lot of data out there, but it's not really uh, captured properly and communicated properly and modeled properly so that everybody can use it. And it's still data and statistics is still the field of, of experts and it should not be you know, like, like, like the early computer age it was these programmers in the basement and then you maybe accept or can't accept, but you don't have no relation as a normal person. And now, fortunately, in a different age, we are on a computer, we have Zoom, we connect together. And that's what we need to do with data. Everybody needs to use it and consume it without having a PhD in statistics. And that's what Homi um, came up with, and I'm helping him in, in this World Data Lab setting. And obviously, the data you need for everything. You need data on climate, you need data on the economy, data on demography, on your health. Um, and so the, the opportunities are endless. And what the team started and initially was uh, population IO, which I launched at a TED talk, which just personalizes this very abstract concept of demography and to check out, you know, how long would you live as a normal UK citizen who moved to the uh, who moved to Hong Kong or as a Chinese person who's maybe active in Australia? What is the difference? And it depends obviously on your age, on your gender, on your home country. And it gives you already a sense of, yeah, that's an orientation, a data point I can then use in my life, obviously, that you can enhance with health variables. And yeah, later on, I'll show you a bit, I'll talk a bit about economic shifts that you can also model in real time, especially in a COVID context. Um, and so one of the things that we talked about earlier also was one demographic in particular, which is becoming, I guess, a priority for many governments, whether it's China with their single child policy now going to a three or more child policy and et cetera. And that's a diminishing population in some ways, um, but there's an increasing population from what the stats tell us in elderly uh, what is defined as elderly is I guess over 65 uh, age group and that's only going to increase so how how is sort of the data that you're consuming today uh, which I guess is based on historics in terms of census census uh, censuses and others uh, forms of data collection how do we how do we or how do you I should say persuade uh, your target audience to to take this and then it's more about looking forward to make more um informed decisions no i, I think uh, michael the so critical just to put out numbers clearly and we're a bit inspired obviously how hans rossing did it and he 
only explain the world until today and we'll move forward and I'll show you this on the example you mentioned on seniors in a minute. But um, just putting the numbers out clearly actually helps to shape, you know, or to reframe key debates. There's still a debate in some parts of the world that says, okay, we're having too many people in the world. Um, you can debate, in, especially in context of climate, but then the next assumption is, yeah, well, there's too many babies. Well, that's a complete fundamental disconnect. There's more people, not because of more babies. There's actually the number of children is actually flat in the world, 2 billion 20 years ago, 2 billion today, 2 billion in, in 20 years. So the only group that's growing in the world is people like you and I, <laughs> older people or adults. And that's a good thing because people live longer. And so that's a poor fundamental fact that is actually always novel when I present it. It's okay, population growth is normal and is a good thing because the alternative would be really bad, which means we would live shorter. Now, the key demo the demographic that's growing fastest is seniors. But again, it's important to note they're growing from a low base. So business-wise, they're a huge opportunity, but they're a smaller cake or piece of the cake and say the 45 to 65 year olds, or even the 30 to 45 year olds. And here, this is the machine that um, the Walter Lab team built. Uh, it's called Market Pro. It's um, companies can use it and really segment their market. So if they want to be interested in the seniors, you, you click the seniors, there's actually 756 million now in the world. So out of a world of seven point, almost 8 billion, that's, you know, it's a portion. It's, it's a little more than 10, 10%. A uh, little less than 10%. So it's not dominant, but it was way less. But let's look what happens in the next 10 years. It reaches a billion. So seniors will be a billion people group. Um, and wow. it's growing by, as you see here, 3.2% per year, but that obviously accumulates. But their spending grows by 5.1%. So let's check, let's check rich seniors, just as an illustration. The seniors are not so many. Seven, there will be 70 million. So a little a, a bit like France in the future, the whole if all the seniors were equivalent to one country, it would be like France. And so 6.2% um, is growth um, for them. So that's a, a, you know, a sizable uh, group. Now let's check China. And that's the that's ultra, ultra high net worth, basically. Yeah. yeah, no, even less than that. So it's ultra high net worth would be, would be the, like the, the top of those group, but it's okay. 200 million people in the world. So it's like 3% of the world. So the, um, it's not the top 1%, but the top 3%. People who don't worry about money anymore, but they don't have to be billionaires to, uh, sure. for, to use that analogy. And so you see China, again, a low number, old, rich seniors. Again, we have two segments, old and rich, um, but it's growing a lot by 19 to 20%. So that um, gives an illustration of how you, know, you can use the tool and then download the data and segment further. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, a client, if you like, uh, I don't, uh, up to you if you want to share who it was, but you talked about a skincare product client that needs to know this kind of data. I mean, when they're looking forward of like how much uh, do they spend on a particular segment or country uh, by age uh, or how is their current spending being um, evaluated? Is it in the right areas, for instance? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that, that's yeah, so we, important. You know, it's not just about, you know, the Google analytics and, and, and even Bardu, if you're in China market, there's, you have to have other sources of data in order to actually get much more an accurate uh, viewpoint on this spending. Uh, absolutely, Michael. And uh, what you just referred to is, you know, the analogy of once you lost your key and you have only your torch, you only look where your where the light is instead of where the key might be. So the, the point is you need always need to have, have the totality and even companies like Google and Facebook, even though many use them, not everybody is using it. And uh, consumer good companies need to know who else could I reach beyond Facebook and Google. And if I have Facebook and Google ads, you know, how many actually are there in reality? Because if you are in Facebook, then there's also Instagram and it's really Facebook accounting that properly and separating it and analyzing it in a way that benefits that, that client, uh, to use an example. So just to walk you through, again, uh, a few illustrative facts that came from that or trends. So mm -hmm. what are, if you are a global company that wants to expand and make more business, obviously there's a few obvious insights, you know, there is growth in the world despite COVID and despite some of the, the doomsday scenarios that happened. Sure. Um, but the growth is mostly in Asia. You know, middle class is growing by roughly four people per second, and uh, more than three people are being added in Asia. But where exactly should you target? So what are the big things? One thing where then company strategy has changed is India. India yeah. is a big growth market, but not everywhere. It is especially 
and I, look, I go down now here and you can look at this, the, the core table, India will have 1.5 billion people that will be larger than China in 2030. But the big action here, and that's where my cursor is now, 15%, 20, 25% of the economy, that's uh, um, 50, that's almost 60% of the economy is in the lower middle class. So in India, you'll make a lot of business, not with the rich people, not with the poor people, but with that lower middle class. And then you need to segment them very carefully and be quite surgical of how do you target people who spend 20 to 30 dollars a day people have a little less than a thousand dollars a month to spend they'll not uh, go on a uh, you know on an exclusive vacation they will not buy the most expensive perfume but they will buy a shampoo and how many women age 45 um, would be in this segment that's what these companies are ne uh, need to then target marketing properly sizing pricing everything yeah very interesting uh, and India, you know, with all that's going on in that sort of uh, region from a geopolitical purpose, suddenly India's become even more important once again to the democratic parts of the world. So uh, I think India's well placed to enjoy further attention um, from an Indo Pacific label that uh, Camilla Rice, uh, sorry, Camilla Harris uh, in uh, Singapore mentioned yesterday. Uh, with at the press conference with the Prime Minister of uh, Singapore. So it's interesting, India and China, I think those two countries, whilst there's been a little bit of border dispute, they, they're going to be very important trading partners going forward. And it's going to be interesting to, to really monitor the data of inflows, outflows between those countries. Is it going to increase? Is it going to flatten or decrease? But most people think it's going to further increase. And India may get a slightly bigger slice of the pie as well, where it's been a little bit one lopsided. Um, so coming back to that, I mean, the whole purpose of the, the data sets and everything, analyzing markets and developing expansion strategies for companies. Um, are you also helping, obviously, I would have thought governments from this perspective, is, is government starting to utilize and see the value in what you're doing? No, I think absolutely. Um, and uh, there are, you know, to give the examples, the and, and the, the, the German government is uh, supported the development of what's called the World Poverty Clock because when all governments in the world, including the you know the Chinese, the uh, the UK, the Australian governments, in, embraced the SDGs and the data revolution with it, people will ask now, what is it? <laughs> what is it? Where is the data revolution? And data revolution is not okay. Let's do more capacity building in Indonesia with a statistical office. That's that's nice to do. But revolution people felt something different. So a nice and logical starting point is to know, let's count the poor, let's count the poor in real time, let's estimate it, let's make a trajectory and say, are we on track, are we off track? Uh, that's what the world wants to know. And the clock is ticking because 2030 is just around the corner. So it'll be just nice to know, are we on track, are we off track? And, and every country will ask that question, every county might ask that question, and we should give an answer, and the answer should not be a book, the answer should be a number. And uh, that's um, what the World Poverty Clock has done, the World, the World Hunger Clock. Now Germany is quite keen to support what's called the World Climate Clock. A lot of action happening, but still the simple key numbers that show what is the mission of Singapore today in cars, and what's the number connected with that is again something which probably will benefit broader society. And so those are illustrations of how governments um, and you know, in a global context can em embark themselves on the data revolution. Yeah, and sort of just building on that conversation a bit, I mean, when we talk about some of the uh, exciting areas like digital twins of cities that has been spoken about, um, in a digital twin, obviously you can adjust it based on the modeling that you're doing so you're taking digital twin of the actual city but then when you're tweaking it to actually what you'd like to see it potentially move towards um and where the efficiencies could be built in i would have thought there's there's links there with technology and data you know linking so you'll gather the data and you're making now these modeling predictions but then attaching it to the technology advancements is that happening at all in certain countries like singapore for instance where they're trying to become the leader in that whole area yeah. But to the extent I, I know, you know, Singapore is at the frontier of that. And you mentioned mobility and, you know, this, you know, uh, flexible pricing schemes that, that Singapore has um, and that um, other countries have been adopting and that you can easily you know, connect also to emissions is probably where, where things go. But then there's even more, I guess, happening in terms of broader 
frontier of mobility. And I think we all have been waiting for the driverless cars, but eventually it will come and that obviously will, will reshape a lot of things, especially better use of resources because once cars can move a bit like planes do now that you don't have to own it, but to move it, then you can organize it better. So you need fewer of them um, and can reshape cities and make them more livable and safer. Um, and so, yeah, there are a lot of, um, I think, you know, illustrations of where we are, I think, at the cusp, we just see an, an early stage of something that will, you know, fundamentally alter our lives, and I'm quite convinced will better our lives. And when you're talking to either potential uh, clients to work with or existing clients, how, uh, can you give one or two examples of how you're using the data for their benefit? Uh, I mean, we spoke, we've touched upon it a little bit with, like, say, skincare product uh, conglomerate. But is there, can you give one or two other examples of, you know, early success cases where they're using the data the right way? Yeah. Now, let me give you two examples. One is more from the, from the commercial side and the other is more from the big data government side on how you can use the Perfect. tools. Um, um, so on, um, so again, another, as you know, I'm covering Africa now. And so here's, there was actually a big um, mistake by, unfortunately, by a big a global conglomerate who used the wrong definition of the middle class and then invested a lot in East Africa, but then uh, people didn't buy the product, even though the middle class was rising, but it was rising from a very low base. And so that if you define a middle class as people who are starting at $3 a day, they would not buy a standard commercial product uh, or a, you know, a shampoo or a chocolate by, by some of those global players where you just people don't have the spending power to, to do that. Um, so now, uh, for example, toothpaste is a key, you know, key value for everybody. Um, and there's a big market, but as there is a big market below, say, the $11 threshold. And there is now a sizing and pricing taking place across Africa to really make some a toothpaste rollout much more, um, much more targeted and much more efficient for everybody. And then you, everybody, also the poorer segments, can get toothpaste easily, but at the right price. Um, on the big data space, this is uh, something with the Asian Development Bank. Um, obviously, these, um, there, there's now, I think, breakthroughs happening in how you measure and monitor road uh, quality, right? Because uh, traditionally you would you had to have an official and you wouldn't have him, you know, move around and check the roads or you have a standard schedule of maintenance, but you should maintain earlier if the road has a hole or later if it doesn't have a hole. And so how could you do that? Well, you can put sensors on some cars and you can model from space the quality of roads. And then you need then machine learning and artificial intelligence to say, yeah, well, in this portion of Kuala Lumpur, you know, let's maybe do some some maintenance a bit earlier. So those are illustrations of where some of the, the new world and the old world connect. That's that's really really interesting because obviously that could then be applicable to to broader industries as well. Like as we call it, a preemptive uh, solution, if you like, to ongoing issues. Especially if you're going to go to autonomous cars, you kind of want smooth roads for them to to travel on. <laughs> Otherwise, they they might uh, have a problem. <laughs> Uh, when they hit a pothole. So uh, that's really, really quite interesting. Um, so coming back to, I guess, wearing your economist hat now for a second, um, how has, you know, how has, I guess, the last 18 months been? You know, if you could cast your mind back to 2019, pre-COVID, to, to where you are today, what are, I guess, what are the lessons you've learned yourself personally as an economist over the last 18 months that you, you're happy to share? Well, one lesson is there's nothing one we can take for granted, but the second lesson is life will still go on. And um, even if it's as extreme as, uh, as it has, we have experienced. So first on the first point, uh, to not take things for granted, um, what people often forget is, um, but people in Asia like you would uh, attest to, is that the global financial crisis was actually not a global crisis. It was a Western crisis and Asia kept going strong and basically saved the day economically. And that's why if you look at the middle-class modeling that Tommy Karras and I are involved, uh, you see even in 2008, nine, there's still a slight growth of the middle-class and not a decline globally. It declined in the West, but it, China especially compensated for that. COVID is different. COVID was a global crisis. It is a global crisis and infected everybody. And for the first time since recording happened, the middle class, which is again, a key metric of what we talk about here, or the consumer class has been declining. And again, we should emphasize it's declining even though people were at it, right? Since COVID, babies were born, 
fewer people died than in the past. So every year we add 80 million people. So that should be the minimum that we should add into the middle class to, to just stabilize the non-middle class. But that's in addition to these 80 million, we had even more people than going below the line, so to say. So that is the, the, the importance to state that. And many countries are still suffering from that, and especially in Africa, and are, will take a long time to recover. Having said that, again, important to note, that's why life goes on. Today, the middle class is larger than before COVID, the global middle class. We, we recovered the COVID decline, and now we've been exceeding it. And again, it's a lot to Asia. Obviously, America has been rebounding strongly. Europe is rebounding okay. Um, and so we are at least back on that trajectory uh, to future growth. And, uh, and in this sense, if you look at very long-term trends of say the middle class, which was not so long ago, just a billion, we just reached actually 4 billion and it will probably be 5 billion by 2030. So COVID in that sense would be a blip but in the, in the long-term trend. Now it is a blip unlike the rest, which is smooth, but in the big scheme of things, big message is still global middle-class growth continues. Wolfgang, a question there. I mean, you don't have to answer if you don't know, but a lot gets pointed at the what we call what you define as the rich people. Have rich people got richer? Is that a group that's grown during the pandemic? Um, well, typically, actually, that was a financial crisis too. Rich people actually suffer a lot. If we, if we use that term, obviously, we, we don't have to be. Uh, you know, they, they can manage, unlike the poor. That's obviously the big story always, you know, mm. rich people have less stock market value in a certain point in time. That's okay. That's what the risk is and they can maintain. But obviously that, that reduces inequality and that happened at least during the global crisis. Obviously in COVID was different because then stock markets recovered very quickly. And obviously the rich have much more flexibility to adjust and to benefit. Um, but that's a bit like also in non-COVID times. The rich obviously do well if they're globally connected and there's a global market now for, for fashion, for music, for soccer players. And that's why these guys are quite wealthy and they probably for them, if you check the neck, normal soccer player probably is doing worse than during COVID, but again, he's super wealthy still. So I think this rich poor debate is, is not in that sense so central or relevant. The key question is still, uh, is some everybody moving still along? And again, some countries yeah, yeah. are becoming more unequal, but other countries have become more equal. Uh, but those countries have become more equal are not in the headlines. Uh, say Brazil 10 years ago was so unequal and now it's getting a bit less so. That obviously helps in the statistics. But the big growth, I think, across Asia is everywhere. Should the rich grow a lot and they're in the media, but also everybody grows. Everybody lives longer. Um, my maid in Indonesia, she earns now roughly double than 10 years ago, and that's perfectly fine. That's just what what fortunately progress has brought to these countries. And does, do you see, obviously I would have thought anyway, this, these data sets are so important to forming policies, you know, taxonomy in particular, I would have thought by governments, and, uh, you know, they're looking at maybe if the middle class is increasing, could that potentially in certain demographics, if it's showing in a certain country, they may say, well, we could maybe look at increasing revenues there. Uh, by taxing certain goods and services, uh, it won't really harm as the middle class group has grown. Would that be conversations around the data that it's showing? No, I think that's an excellent uh, point, Mark. And so far, I haven't come across that use case. So thank you for bringing it up. There's clearly an opportunity if you also think, obviously, because what uh, the status and measures is consumer spending, which then is consumption, which is very much closely linked to, say, a VAT type tax. And with the data, at least you can model of what you can anticipate. Obviously, with taxation is always a tricky fine line, right? Because there's also, you can have the equal debate and say, which, where do you have a strong middle class growth and where have a weak growth? And maybe there's something with the business environment or with the incentives of people to, to be active and spend. Um, but clearly, you could calibrate and just, you know, target, get a sense of where you have which buckets and if with which taxation taxonomy you can create which optimal results so i think with you know using that approach and using the segmentation that i showed that's actually an excellent suggestion and just building on that very one other question i'm not sure but i would have thought debt levels of particular countries by demographic is that something that's uh, shown at all is there any financials uh, data coming through from a debt perspective into this um, no, I think that's again another um, I think great idea, and I think what one to the, the data set I showed, the best analogy, the best way to use it is a bit like think of, of your Windows computer when it started today. It's something you really have to have. 
but it's just the basics. And on top, sure. you have your other tools. And it's a bit similar. You have a core data set that basically gives you the, the, the single source of truth in the best possible estimate. But then on top, you can load everything. You can load shampoo data, you can load debt data, you can load government taxation data. Um, but then you get a lot of segmentation and get a, insights that we may not be aware at this stage. Maybe, you know, maybe old people are more in debt in Philippines than they are in Pakistan or the other way around. And there's a certain segment within the old people that has a certain profile. All those things you could then, I think, analyze once you would uh, use the example that you just made and overlay it with the data. So what's keeping you up at night at the moment, Wolfgang? What's, uh, what, what is it you're working on today that you can share? Um, well, the most, um, I think, exciting uh, new project would be around uh, helping to get good numbers into the global climate change debate. And um, um, there is obviously, um, you know, it affects every country, and there's many more emerging economies, including South Africa, which is a big you know, polluter um, as well, unlike most other African countries. Um, and obviously, the debate is very heated, um, to use that term. Um, and it's very intense, uh, and uh, people have a lot of fears, fears to lose wealth, fears to lose the planet, um, and uh, all are, you know, have all a, a portion of truth, but nobody has yet that simple key data machine that tells you, okay, let me check out in Bangladesh uh, this month, how much was, you know, how many emissions did Bangladesh, uh, you know, produce in coal, in cars, in cows, um, in anything else, and how does this Bangladesh mix compare with the Pakistan mix or the Cambodia mix? Um, that is not there. Uh, you know, um, even people who ask me, what is more important in Germany? Is it car pollution from cars or pollution from coal? I wouldn't know, although it's, it's just a number, right? Again, we have 50 gigatons that's being polluted, put in the air every year, and that 50 gigatons need to have a reflect a re need to be reflected in the amount of emissions German cars produce, and it's not available easily. And then again, the whole question of modeling comes in uh, for the future, but also that po key policy question: How can you? What is actually easier to phase out than others? So maybe cars is easier because with electric and driverless cars, that's solved. Chemical industry is much harder, and that's still a big portion, it's almost as much as coal, as as, uh, as cars. So those are the type of I think new frontier data models we need. For this big global debate that, that we are all somehow part of. No, and I think you're, you're spot on there is, you know, some sectors, you could argue it's it's already started a decarbonization um, and it and certain areas are easier to to tackle than others. And, and one that's much more challenging is, for instance, aviation, which is not necessarily the biggest polluter, but by percentage, by because of the other sectors decarbonizing faster, aviation becomes a bigger percentage uh, by 2030 and beyond. So, you know, hydrogen is a debate whether that's the solution. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, SAF, sustainable aviation fuel is, you know, being distributed quite wildly, wildly, not wildly, widely in the US um, in particular. And they've, you know, in some ways they've used, in the absence of airlines flying globally at the moment, they've used the business aviation sector as a scapegoat to sort of guilt the users into paying more, which is working very well. Um, but it's still a drop in the ocean. It's not even, I think, 1% of the total jet fuel is, is SAF at the moment. So there's a long way to go. It's not a silver bullet. But these are sort of the debates around, you know, coal-powered coal stations that are still being built in Vietnam, for instance, uh, even though there's a lot of pressure for them not to go ahead. And, you know, backers like Japan and Korea starting to sort of announce that they won't be funding these kind of projects anymore going forward, which is welcome. But there's still, you know, a brand new coal fired power station is still something that's been built in the last five years and it's got a shelf life of at least 30 years, right? So, how do you make sure that the ownership of these coal power fire stations are? The right kind of ownerships that are overseeing a decarbonization uh, process because there seems to be this rush or exit uh, from portfolios that's got anything to do with fossil fuels uh, but you're, you're just going to hand them over to less scrupulous owners and stakeholders who don't really care for the standards and potentially that you know adds another problem rather than a solution so sometimes you know the big boys like even i don't, don't want to name them but you know the big boys are in that space may need to think twice about pulling out altogether, but actually oversee the transformation um, and, and make sure that it is implemented in the right way. So it doesn't affect, you know, local populations or, or 
other pollution uh, risks. So yeah, there's a lot to, to sort of uh, digest and, uh, in, in the different sectors. And I guess the final part I wanna talk about because we've got a lot of these big events coming up in the autumn um, ahead of us, like COP26 in Glasgow, delayed by one year. They've, there's the G20, there's the ASEAN summit and the APEC New Zealand. Uh, a lot of these are virtual, but I know COP is an in-person event again. But um, any thoughts there? I mean, do you see already, I mean, obviously a lot of countries have been committing to targets, but um, do you see anything else that we're hoping to hear uh, from some of these uh, global in events or it's already kind of half cooked, half baked already? <laughs> mm. I guess, and maybe Michael, you're a bit closer to that action, but I guess it is, uh, I don't think there'll be big surprises, the big somehow positive, if you can say so, is there some more uh, a global alignment on, on issues. It's not, the, it's not the, 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 the aim itself that's in question, it's more to how to get there. And I think the points you just made are exactly what one would need. And I hope that, you know, a bit this debates, uh, like, you know, the climate debate becoming as exciting as, uh, as soccer is or football is. So to say, okay, you need to let's make it a competition. Let's make sure your county reaches, you know, net zero by as quickly as possible. And let's let the champion then win the gold medal. And hope, yeah, I hope Vietnam can still reduce, you know, can get to net zero emissions. And let's just calculate the numbers. If they if they still do have one coal power plant standing in 2050, then uh, I guess they need to do carbon capture or plant a lot of trees and you can again calculate that, but everything else has to be close to zero. Um, and then let's see, are they on track with the, with the cows to be on, on zero with the chemical sector, which is harder to even coal and with all the other uh, segments with aviation. Um, but so yeah, let's just look at the numbers and see how is Vietnam actually doing um, compared to everybody else, that'll be, I think, extremely valuable because if you have these numbers, then you can do this on track, off track in a super, in a, in a relatively granular level. Because uh, obviously, we're still going up with the emissions. So I hope we'll go down at some point. Some countries start to go down, but we're probably not going down fast enough, which is an analogous to the poverty discussion. Poverty is going down, but not fast enough. And so, but emissions in Vietnam, maybe they will not go down much in coal, but they will go down elsewhere. And again, you can measure and see what's on track, what's off track. And if you have that, then you have can create almost like within country and between country and between sector competitions that then are create create the kind of pressure and excitement of of getting there. No, I totally agree, and I think you're seeing obviously that in certainly the public sector domain, you know, where ESG reporting mandates are required in certain exchanges like Singapore and Hong Kong. Now, if you're public listed, you have to, you know, I think they've been doing it already for five years already, but I think now there's real focus on what is the ESG reporting producing. Uh, there's mm. obviously been a bit of skepticism about greenwashing and stuff like that. So companies that are, how, are much more aware that they're being scrutinized on what the results of ESG is. And uh, I think that's, that's welcome. There's, obviously carbon exchanges that have been one in Singapore and there's a debate now in Hong Kong whether they should do one as well on the back of what China's done for some of their SOE, uh, SOEs in the uh, heavy industry sector. Obviously there's a long way to go there but it's all positive moves uh, in the right direction from that perspective but again I think all of this is going to be very much relying on the data as you say so coming back to the whole purpose of our talk today you know putting data at the center of everything, uh, just as in the old days, you used to put sales at the center of everything. <laughs> you know, sales-centric organizations used to be, yeah, sales is the most important, but now I think everybody really does look at the data uh, and make sure that you know, they have what we call the, the sense of truth, as it were, the source of truth, the single source of truth, which is so important to get to whether you're using a blockchain application or, or AI, you still need that single source of truth to start with, to put it, to load it onto yes. these other technologies. Um, so just uh, for your last word there, Wolfgang, uh, you're saying you're helping to, to get good numbers into the climate change debate. Is there anything that you want to uh, share that you're super passionate about? Is there a particular area or is it just in general from a high level point of view? Any sectors that you're really you're really enjoying? I know you're a big football fan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, indeed, as well. Uh, no, I think we can be inspired by the. I think we should not scare off the the simplicity, right? That's why I think uh, Steve Jobs and others were 
are powerful. They made things simple. Like things are very, iPhone is very complicated to build, but the power is it's simple to use. And I think that's what we need in the data revolution as well. It's not, it is not, it's very old fashioned to say, okay, there is the expert and he will say there is a problem. And okay, I believe or I can't believe, but I want to know what is the problem? Is it again a call in Vietnam or is it with the cows in China? Uh, I want to know, I want to know the number. And um, and then if you if you solve this one problem, what does it still add up in the total? Those are things that would actually be so beneficial because it, it would just save so much time and, and effort and wrong debates or, or you know, nonsense debates because if you have the number, then you can just move on and focus really on that. And there's still some numbers that are not ideal and that you need to model and they may be incorrect, but then you find them and you can quicker adjust it. Like, again, like, like development of technology in general. The iPhone today is different than the first iPhone because there was learning and, and things improved. But what I am, um, and just to, to close on the, first of all, I love to, you know, this for me is the defining quote, it's where you said moving from sales centric to data centric organizations. Um, but what I was um, somewhat surprised when I looked a bit more into the climate data is on the proportions, which I wasn't aware. And there's obviously a big debate around cars and automobility, and it's important. But I didn't know that actually cars is only 7% of total emissions of the world. Actually, trucks and buses are 5%, they're almost as much. Um, and then aviation is 2%. So again, there's a lot of focus on aviation. And there's a, some focus on coal, but coal is like 10 times more than, than aviation. Um, and chemicals, nobody talks about. And cement, nobody talks about. But they're actually way bigger than planes. So. Uh, and those things, I think, just to have that clear, those very big numbers, and then hopefully I allocate the debate accordingly, um, itself would be huge. But it's, um, but yeah, there's announcements and says, okay, let's let's make sure that you insulate our buildings properly. It's a good thing, but how much does it matter, really? I'd like to know, and this data will then then show. So no, that's what I'm going to. Yeah, quite I, I think about. you're right. There is is addressing the the big problems first, because you can make the biggest impact. It's not to say that sectors should not be uh, cleaning up their own house, as it were. They should be, there should be pressure. And I think that that's happening um, just because of public debate. But I think the debate is sometimes skewed onto those sort of high profile, easy to pick on rather than the ones underlying, as you say, which are actually the ones, the biggest polluters. Um, so that's really important. and. Um, I've lost my trail of thought now to finish up there, with, uh, but it doesn't matter. But I wanted to say that um, the dashboard scenario, as you mentioned, simplifying the data, the access to data, and then to uh, find what you're looking for easily. That's kind of a scenario that I'm using now because it's not just what you're, you have produced, but I find a dashboard scenario or solution is very handy for those non-technical experts or data uh, technicians who just need to find that uh, sense of truth, as it were, coming back to that single source of truth, to be able to use that data figure for what they're going to have a conversation about in a meeting coming up or with a client or making decision. Uh, it's so, so important. And we're seeing that in all sectors as well, not just uh, what you're doing, but you know, coming back to my aviation background, uh, it's just having this sort of dashboard that connects all the existing softwares that are out there in a particular company, putting it under one umbrella and then giving external access through security means to the end client who actually wants to see the performance of their asset, you know, in real time. So this dashboard, I think, is going to become more and more the means at which we display the data. It doesn't necessarily mean we need to know what's going on behind in terms of all the coding and the sophistication. But as you say, Steve Jobs and others made it very easy to use. And if we can continue that with what you're doing, you're doing an amazing job with the World Lab and, and there's huge amounts of data, but making it easy, accessible and easy to understand is definitely the way forward. So thank you so much, uh, Wolfgang, for joining us today. For those who couldn't uh, view the, the YouTube screen, um, you can look on our link on our website. Uh, there'll be links to all the websites that uh, Wolfgang mentioned uh and maybe we'll uh also if there's real interest then we can also connect you with full gang if you would like a full demonstration of the software uh i do implore you to really take a look at it because it's really fascinating what it can produce and certainly from an asia pacific selfish perspective i'm certainly going to be taking even more looks at it and hopefully sharing it some more and maybe we can build it into some of our 
white paper submissions going forward, some of the data points at which we can then quote uh, as, as a true sense of source. So Wolfgang, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we'll leave it there for now and uh, enjoy the rest of uh, your week. And I don't know if you're on holiday at the moment in, in enjoying any late summer. Is, is the schools back there in Vienna? School just starting back. And so we still have the nice phase out of the summer here. But so, yeah, I'm slowly getting back to in action. But but yeah, this this uh, exchange was rather, I was joyful. I didn't see work. So it was, thank you for having me, Michael. And you know, all the best with, with you. And to, thank you for connecting me to that broader Asia Pacific community. No problem at all. Thanks, Wolfgang. The Value Prop Show is brought to you by PBEC, the Pacific Basin Economic Council. Your co-hosts are Miguel Aboitis and Michael Walsh from PBEC. You can follow us and subscribe on our LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter. Thanks for watching and listening, and see you in the next episode.